Back at the end of October, we posted a video that described how the big 14-inch guns on Battleship Texas were loaded and prepared for firing. While that is certainly the most important aspect of the process, it is only a very small part of what it took to get them ready. The process started in magazines located several decks below the turrets where shells and powder were stored. They were then moved and hoisted in a complex series of operations until they ended up in the turret gun houses. We need to start by looking at an interior profile of the overall system to see how things worked. In order to do so, we also need to divide it into functions consisting of powder handling, shell handling, the lower handling room, and a portion of the gun house. One thing to note about the red dashed box in the gun house is that it represents the danger zone that must be clear of crew while the gun is ready to fire or being fired. All other areas were safe to work in at any time, allowing continuous operation of the shell hoist and movement of shells onto the dump tray and rammer tray. Let's jump into this by starting in the magazines and following the movement of powder bags from their storage tanks to the turret. So if we're going to talk about how powder got from the magazines up to the turret, then the first thing we have to talk about is what happened in the magazines. We're currently standing in one of the uh, powder magazines that serve turrets four and five. Now, right now, it's pretty stripped. In fact, it had wood decking that was down. And if you look, you'll see that there are spacers that held it off the steel deck. But we also have these little saddles that run here. There's two rows here, two rows there. There's actually another door that leads into the room beyond that, and another two sets of saddles. Now, what those were used for is they would, uh, those are what held or propped up the uh, powder tanks, which were the containers that powder bags were stored in. They were hermetically sealed so that no moisture could get into the, to them, which is very critical for powder stability. In any case, uh, they were quite large, about that big around and about that long, because each one held two powder bags. The, the, uh, the tanks had little grooves uh, uh, in them, or sorry, notches rather, and they sat in the grooves of these saddles, so that locked the first row. Then they would just stack them on top and they went as far as six tanks high. So that would put it at about my head level. Again, those grooves and, and fingers that are in the tanks uh, allowed them to kind of lock with each other. Additionally, there were removable stanchions. They were spaced here and here and more to where it would keep, in case of any real radical movement, it would kind of hold them to where they wouldn't slide endwise out of the stack. So we, to, to move powder out of here, we had what was called a tank man. And it was his job, he would, uh, he would work these two rows of tanks. Now tanks would sit on this side with their covers this way and one this, with one this way. Over on the other side where there's another door, there was another tank man over there. And again, he stood between two rows that had their lids facing toward him. So when they needed powder, he would he'd take a wrench, he would remove the lid, set it up on top of the tank. There's a strap on the powder bag that he could use to haul it out. He would pull it out and he would hand it to a powder man. Now there would be a powder man standing here who would then take it from him. Now these things weigh 105 pounds each, so it wasn't just a matter of handing it to him. They'd lug it and they'd hand it to him arm-wise like this. That powder man would, would take it out. Same thing's going over on over on the other side. So that's how they move bags out. Now here's one thing. We have actually a good understanding based on old gunnery manuals of how all of these spaces were man was manned except for one thing, and that's the powder passers. Uh, and there are other compartments and place, spaces that are so limited in size, they can say, well, you have two powder passers, two powder men, whatever you want to call them. But in here, in the, in, in the powder magazine, and also in the powder handling room that we're going to see shortly, there was a lot of space. So uh, they didn't talk about the numbers because I think they kept that flexible. The fact is, is the more men you could put in here up to the point that they were tripping over each other, the faster you could move powder and the less fatigued they would become. So that gets it out of the tank and up to the door, and then we'll go out into the powder, into the powder handling room. Once he finished with the tank, he'd put the lid back on so that you didn't have a lot of lids lying around. Now, one thing I don't know, because there's never been any indication, uh, is uh, how they could tell which tank was empty and which was full once the lids were on. If I had to guess, what I would do anyway would be to take a piece of chalk or a wax pencil just make a mark on it to indicate that it was empty. So we're now in the powder handling room. Uh, the powder magazine that I just showed is right here to my right, your left, and I'm standing in front of one of the closed powder scuttles 
that uh, fed into the number five handling room. Now, uh, whenever uh, power was being passed, whether it's practice or, or uh, even during, especially during warfare, this door that led into the uh, handling room was always closed and dogged, just as a basic safety protection. We also have a powder scuttle here that uh, is open and ready to take powder. So what would happen is the powder man that's inside the room would pass it to a powder man standing here. He would then take that bag, would walk it over to this scuttle, he would drop it on the tray and push it into the scuttle. What you can't see is this is a rounded uh, opening here. And that powder scuttle actually seal uh, the two rooms from each other. And as soon as I go in the handling room, I'll show you how that operated to take powder. Now, anytime they were going to fire both guns on the turret, that means that uh, with uh, two guns uh, or two guns in a turret, that's a total of eight powder bags because one charge for to fire one round took four bags. So we also have another another powder magazine on the other side that's well out of the view of the camera. That means they had to move four bags out of here and then four bags out of there. There's a total of four scuttles here. So that also means that uh, each, each uh, room, each door coming from the two powder rooms had to move two bags out. So that's why I think that what they would have had is uh, a powder passer here, a powder passer on the other door on this side, and then two more powder passers on the two doors over there. This allowed for very short walks. He would take the powder bag from the guy inside the room, set it down, push it in. That would be cycled through. In the meantime, he steps out of the way, getting ready for another bag if necessary, and another powder man would bring it over as soon as this opened up. He would uh, shove that bag in, and that took care of their life. Now, as soon as the, there's no way for these guys on the other side to know whether there's a bag in there or not. So there's a little telegraph here that tells them they can bring it, and a pointer on the other side would tell uh, the, the uh, powder men on the other side that, uh, that the, um, there was a bag and it was ready to move. We're currently standing in the handling room for turret 5, and I just want to do a quick pan around. All of this stuff that you see in the middle is actually attached to the bottom of the turret and when the turret rotates or trains, all of this moves with it on that center column. That center column contains the electrical wiring and compressed air lines that run up to the turret. Now you can tell where uh, everything that rotates because you see this ring around there. Everything inside of that is what rotates. Now we, uh, the powder scuttles that we talked about, here's two of the scuttles here. And now let's talk about uh, what was done to move those. Now one other thing to be aware of is that this room was not only crowded with people, but it was busy. And there are some pretty hazardous things. Besides the fact that you would likely had eight powder passers carrying as many, up to eight bags of powder in here, you also had uh, uh, shell men moving the big uh, either 1,275-pound high-capacity shells or 1,500-pound armor-piercing shells from the shell magazines into the hoist, which we're going to cover in a different video. But because there were so many people in here, order had to rule the day. And the big thing is traffic. You don't want people getting in each other's way, so what they did was everything happened in a clockwise rotation around here. If you brought powder, or if you were pushing a projectile, once you were done, even if it meant walking twice as far as you had to, you always walked clockwise to get back to where you wanted to go. There's one other thing to note, too. Again, all of this rotates, so depending upon where the uh, turret was, was aimed, it was very likely going to be in either over the port or starboard side, which means that this uh, hoist, powder hoist, is going to either be over here or over there, and the, uh, the shell hoist are going to be, uh, instead of facing their, their uh, uh, magazines, they're going to be here or here, so there's going to be a lot of movement in here. So inside the handling room at each of the scuttles was a scuttle man. Four scuttles, four scuttle men. And it was his job to bring the power from the uh, powder handling room into here. In order to do that, once he heard on the telegraph that a bag was ready, he could put his foot up here and he'd rotate this cylinder, bag would roll out. There would be a powder man standing here ready to grab that bag. Once, uh, once uh, he, um, the bag was out of there and clear of it, then he could, he could then bring back 
and rotate the valve empty scuttle back ready for another bag. In the meantime, the powder man here would take that bag and he would carry it around around this side and we'll pick up here in just a second. So the powder man that just picked up a bag from the scuttle walks around here. He's going to take that bag and he's going to hand it to a hoist man. And it's the hoist man's job to take that bag and he sets it in one of the trays that's inside this hoist. This is called a dredger type hoist and we'll uh, show you here in a little bit but you'll be able to see the fingers and the power bags will then be hoisted up to the next level which is called the divider. Now the hoist man had a telegraph over here. He also had a talker. This talker stood there and helped relay verbal orders up there in case there's any misunderstanding. But down here there's a telegraph that would ring up to the dividing room where the uh, upper hoist man up in the dividing room uh, actually controlled this hoist. At this point, eight bags are in the powder hoist and on their way to the powder flat, also called the dividing room. It is here that bags will be separated so that four go to the left gun and four to the right gun. One thing about this room is it's very small and cramped. You can see on the diagram that crews stood elbow to elbow and even sat on the deck in order to perform their jobs. Okay, we are now in a very tight space located just below the uh, gunwale of the turret. This is called the dividing room. When the powder bags come up from the lower handling room on that single hoist, this is where they come out. They come out through here, and this can be latched up. And I'm not sure about the camera angle, but you can see the uh, top of the hoist here as the powder came up. It would roll out onto this tray. This is a brass tray. And the hoist man stood here. He had a controller by handles on it. And he could raise or he could start and run that, uh, that hoist to either raise or lower powder bags. From here there would be a powder man standing right here and one on the other side. As the bags came out, they would shove one bag this way and one bag this way. Because this one fed the right gun, this one fed the left gun. They would do that until they had four bags lined up on each side. And then the hoist man would stop the hoist. In the meantime, while that's happening, they're continuing to load bags on below because what they wanted was not only four bags here, they also wanted that hoist full of bags. That would save a lot of time if they're doing continuous fire. They're not having to wait for powder bags to come all the way up from below. Now I'm going to change their orientation so that I can show you a little more about what's going on. So, like I said, we had a passer up here close that took bags basically straight off the hoist as they were split to go to either the left or right gun, he would push it to yet another passer standing right here. That passer would then push it around and there is a manual hoist here. I can't drop it all the way down for reasons that you'll become obvious. But this part of the hoist would be pushed all the way down. He could then take the bag and tilt it up and slide it on end onto this hoist. Now the reason I can't push it down right now is might not be easy to see, but there's a T-handle down here. This is a counterweighted hoist. There would be another crew member down sitting on the floor pulling down on that T-handle. That that's a counterweighted hoist. So he had to pull down, if I had to guess, maybe 150 pounds. So his, he used his body weight to lower it. Once the bag was tilted up and set on the end in place, he would let go of that handle and the counterweight would push that bag up through a little uh, scuttle in the deck of the side pocket. Now if you remember that, the side pocket was if you took the, if you saw my video on how to load a 14 inch gun, that is the, uh, th through the little deck hatch in the gun house where there are a couple of guys in there. This is the hoist that sent powder up to them. And then from there they would push it out into the gun well. So we had a hoist man, we had uh, two powder passers here, we had a third one here, that's four people. Well, we had two more powder men and a, and a little hoist man over on that side. So with that, we had a total of seven guys in this room that's pretty small. Let's go back down to the magazines now and take a look at how shells were moved. We're looking into one of the shell magazines for the turret number five handling room. And you can see we actually have one, two, three, we have four uh, real inert high capacity shells in here, no powder charge in them or anything. 
But uh, you can see one thing that may, that's unique to Battleships Texas and New York is that they're stored nose down in these little cups called chocks. Uh, they're, they're held in position by the racks and there's little flaps that flop down and they hold them in place. Uh, it made it very easy to lift the shell up. When they did, those flaps are hinged and they just hinge up out of the way. To lift them, they used what are called chain trolleys. And you can see there's one attached to it now. Now, I'm about to go in the room, but I'm not about to lift that shell. Uh, one person has no business hoisting a shell. So there were three crew members that were assigned to each of the shell back seats. We had a trolley man and we had two shell men. It was the trolley man's job to take what we call a side trolley that ran down each of these rails along each row of shells. He would position it, he would put the hook through one of the lifting eyes, and then he could reuse the chain to raise the shell enough to get it out of that cup. Uh, then with the assistance of the shell men, they would pull it out. Now keep in mind, this is close to the end, but shells, uh, as they consumed shells, as they went farther in, they had to haul the shell all the way out to here. They would then transfer the shell to a transportation trolley. This is why you need two lifting eyes because with the transportation trolley, they would put its hook through there, they would pull tension on it, release tension on this one, and then ease the shell out, and then they could unhook this. At that point, then the two shell men could take and put, start pushing that shell toward the door. In the meantime, the trolley man is going to go on the other side of the room because this room is actually twice as large as what you see here. There's another door over, just not more than about four feet away, and to consume shells evenly, he would switch between. It's a short walk, it's not even like he's really having to put out any effort. But that way they consume shells from here and alternate the two sides. So the two shell men would be pushing the shell out of the magazine. Now this is the lower, the bottom of the lower shell hoist. And remember, it could be anywhere because this whole turret assembly is rotating one way or the other depending upon where the guns are being aimed. But as I uh, may have mentioned to you before, everybody moved in a clockwise position. That means that if this hoist was even just a couple feet that way, they had to walk all the way around. And this is so that uh, they didn't bump into the crowd of people that were in here. Everybody flowed in that direction. In any case, they moved it around, and then once they uh, got up close to the uh, hoist, uh, there was a hoist man here. He would pull the safety chain, they would push the shell in, they would lower the chain on the transportation trolley to where the nose of the shell rested in this cup. They'd push it in place. They'd rehook the chain. In the meantime, uh, the, the, uh, uh, there's the, uh, the cable with the hook that's the lower hoist. They'd hook into one of, the, one of the two eyes. They would unhook the trolley hoist. And then with that, the hoist man could signal up to the shell deck that they could live, raise the shell. And with that, the shell would go up. In the meantime, the uh, two shell men, they're back, uh, cruising back around and headed back to the magazine with their uh, transportation trolley. Once on the hoist, the shell will be lifted to the upper handling room, also called the shell deck. At that point, the shell will either be placed in a storage rack or it will be set in an upper hoist where it will be sent to the turret. So I'm now uh, located in what's called the shell deck, sometimes also called the upper handling room. This is where shells came up from the lower handling room, and uh, from here then they were put on uh, the upper hoist and sent up to the, the uh, turrets. Now, this room was pretty heavily populated. Uh, in here we had a hoist man who controlled it. We had a talker next to him that communicated with the turret. We had what was called a side shell man that handled shells that were in these storage racks. We had up to 15 shells on this side and then also on the side behind you. We also had then a, a lower hoist man that communicated with and controlled the lower hoist. We have two of those, this one here, this one over here. And uh, he could control it. This is where he'd bring the shell up from the handling room. Now, we, uh, between these guys, we also had two more shell men, and it was their job that when a shell came up from the handling room to either take it from here, the, we did have a uh, tro chain trolley that moved around here on this that uh, is no longer here. They would hook it onto the base of the shell that's hanging upside down, uh, remove it from the hoist, 
and then they could either push it over here to the upper hoist, or they might move it to the side uh, uh, rack here if they were loading that. They might even just hold it here because at the same time, we had the uh, side shell man that uh, had a, a chain hoist here, and he might pull a shell from here, and then he and the two shell men would wrestle it over and put it in the hoist. Now, why would they do that? They would do that because uh, they were going for what is the fastest way to get a shell up to the turret. If you have a shell that's already up here on the lower hoist, the easy thing to do it is to move it over here. But if, if they're still down hooking up a shell in, this, in the handling room, they're going to come over here and take a shell that's ready to go here. And as, as a general rule, they could take, uh, for every two shells they took from below, they could take a shell from up here. So if you kind of work some simple math, if you have 15 shells here, that means that they could run a total of 45 shells pretty rapidly until they expended what was here. Well, there's no gunfight that lasts that long. So they were pretty well equipped there. So anyway, they've got the shell here. Now the hoist man, he's gonna remove the safety chain. They're gonna push the shell over it and push its nose into a cup that's in a cradle or what we call, actually call the shell car, and they're going to set it in place. They're going to unhook, they're going to release the trunk of the chain trolley hook. Now, the two removable eyes, lifting eyes, or sometimes what we call pad eyes, are, this is where they're taken off, and they just have to go back down to the magazines. Well, they drop them in this little chute here, and they just fall back down into a little receptacle in the uh, handling room. So they're set up, they're going to put this chain back, and there's a signal here, a telegraph, that if you watched my uh, turret loading video, you'll know that the hoist operator up there had a signal saying raise or lower. Well, if he's saying raise, you can either, the talker can even communicate and say, okay, sure. So there's a lever here. This, this allows, will tell the hoist to go up or down through a mechanical linkage. He's going to put it in the hoist position. Then he's going to use this speed controller that raises the shell up to the turret. As soon as he hears it, it stop and there's going to be a friction clutch up there that slips, he lets off. Then he's, uh, he's going to wait until he sees the command up here to lower. Uh, once the shell is off the hoist, then he's going to reverse this. And he's going to lower the, uh, the shell car back down to the bottom of the hoist where hopefully they've got the shell either here waiting or here waiting. So we have one, we have three shell men, we have a, uh, a, a lower hoist man, we have an upper hoist man, and we have a talker. That's uh, six people over here, if I counted right. We'll say behind you is another full set of those. So that's 12 people up here. Pretty busy place. One last thing, it would be exceptionally difficult to maintain a 45 second firing rate if the procedures described here were closely followed. Filling the system with shells and powder was described in gunnery manuals and very likely done. To accomplish this, shells would be hoisted and placed on both the rammer tray and dump tray in the turret gun house even before any round in the gun was fired. Shells would be sitting in the upper hoist on the shell deck and one held at ready by the side trolley men. Shells would be moved into position in the lower handling room at the bottom of the lower hoist. Four powder bags would be brought into each of the two turret side pockets. Eight bags would be hoisted into the dividing room and eight more placed in the hoist. Doing this greatly shortened the time and distance at every stage required to replenish shells and powder as they were consumed. Whenever a gun fired and was reloaded, new shells and powder were immediately available and the system responded simply by moving the short distances required to fill newly created voids at each point in the system.